Hello, I'm Daniel, and I work at Dropbox. Today I'm going to tell you about Lepton. Lepton is a system Dropbox uses to compress hundreds of petabytes of image files. I'm going to cover the requirements of our system, its deployment, and some interesting stories we, we experienced. But let's start with an overview of Dropbox. Dropbox allows users to share, sync, and collaborate on their files. People actually store a lot of data on Dropbox, and as it happens, last I measured, three quarters of that data is populated by media files. Over a third of Dropbox is actually images, so even a small improvement in the space those images occupy could result in significant savings to the business. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the goals of, of our work. We're not doing ordinary lossless image compression. We're actually doing byte-for-byte -byte transparency of our image. Dropbox is actually a file system, so users expect the images to be bit-for-bit -bit exact. They expect any, any sort of interesting facet that they decided to put in the, in the JPEG to actually be there. If they want to put a bunch of bytes at the end of the JPEG, they expect that to be there too. So the JPEG may not even comply with the JPEG standard, even though the user may experience it as such. Also, Dropbox is distributed. It, ha it stores data in four megabyte chunks, or data of no more than four megabytes. And each, of the, each piece of this data can be stored on a different node. So each of, these, each of these pieces of data needs to be able to be retrieved independently because clients may ask for them in an independent manner. Also has to be real time. Users' clients may ask for an individual chunk and expect it right away. It needs to be secure so that no, so that no, um, um, so basically that even a maliciously formed JPEG doesn't actually cause harm to, to the systems running it. And it also needs to be trustworthy. We need to make sure that the data can be reconstructed every single time when the user asks for it. And this is extremely important. However, media doesn't compare, compress well with generic techniques like Zlib, Bratly, or ZStandard. The average savings for those techniques is about 1%. We actually did this anyway, just to save that. But to compress JPEGs well, we needed to find a solution that actually understood the media files. So if you look at prior work, leading the amount of compression is a tool called PackJPEG. It, it gets a really good compression ratio, of about 22 or 23%. It's bit for bit accurate. However, there are limitations. It doesn't work in a um, distributed manner on a small substring of a JPEG. It's not nearly fast enough for our purposes. So we looked at other solutions like MozJPEG or JPEG Rescan. They both get appreciable compression ratios, but they don't attain the bit-for-bit -bit accuracy that we require. They really just preserve RGB values and not the actual structure of the JPEG like its headers. Lastly, there are Zlib, Bratly, and Z standard, and those do meet all of our requirements. In fact, we use them, but they don't have nearly enough compression ratio. They really get most of their compression from the header itself rather than from the actual, from the actual image data. So to understand how Lepton works, I'll talk a little bit at a high level about how JPEGs work. JPEGs begin with a header that save out Huffman tables to be used. And then the image is broken into eight by eight blocks of 64 pixels a piece. The coefficients of these blocks are transformed into frequency space with an FFT, which put most of the power in the, of the block into the top left corner as it happens. Then the lossy step happens. A large quantizer divides each coefficient individually. This causes many of them to actually round to zero or be very small and easy to compress. This is where the savings happens from using JPEG as opposed to a lossless format. Finally, the results are serialized with the Huffman code in the header. But Huffman coding isn't the only way to save series of uh, data values. For instance, there's also an arithmetic code. And an arithmetic code looks at every value so far, uses all of those values to craft a prediction for the next value. A consistently good prediction results in a losslessly compressed file with fewer bits than a bad prediction. So we actually use an arithmetic code in Lepton. But to get, this, to get the speed of JPEG rescan and the savings from PackJPEG, Lepton leverages two key ideas to work. 
It avoids any full file transformations by having a very sophisticated predictor. And it makes image subsets independently decompressible from one another so that multiple cores can operate upon a single JPEG. And also so that in our distributed manner that we can retrieve four megabyte chunks from different nodes in parallel without depending on one another. So Lepton is able to get about 22% compression by training a massive 2.2 megabyte probability model that seeks out correlations across a whole file. We build on, on the work that PACJPEG does by adding special, um, special prediction elements to predict the DC element using a pixel space transformation and predicting all of the pixels in pixel space. We also, instead of doing a full file sort, we actually have a prediction model that tracks statistics across a whole file. PACJPEG does a full file sort upon statistical properties of the file. And this naturally doesn't lend itself well to, well to streaming. So Lepton actually instead just tracks the statistics as it goes. For more details on this, you can look at the paper. So now we have a streaming probability model, but we had to parallelize the decode. First of all, each thread starts with its own fresh probability model. This reduces compression somewhat, but it allows the threads to be independent from one another. The challenge is that JPEG files are not designed to be streamed. In some sections, they do scan line order delta encoding across pixels, and rows aren't even guaranteed to terminate on byte boundaries. They could have half-filled bytes, for instance. So to address this and, and enable parallelized reconstruction, we actually serialize out the state of the entire Huffman coder so that we could concatenate the results of each th that each thread produced and therefore produce the final file. This allows us to attain both the 100 megabit per second requirement that lets us fill our client's pipes and the same technology lets us support JPEG substrings as long as we include the original header in the compressed leptin file for each substring. By doing all of this th these things, we got this result. Here's a photo of a building, some people in front of it. Now, I'm going to show you the leptin encoded version. Basically, the brighter green it is, the more savings this image gets compared with the original JPEG. So most of the bits of savings come from the very detailed sections where lepton's pixel space predictor gets a good result. And now I'll show you the streaming decode of this image. Each thread is going to work on a chunk of the image. And this is a recording from a real decode, of course, slowed down so you can see it happen. And each thread basically runs in its own chunk, and then the original JPEG is reconstructed bit for bit. Now I'll talk a bit about how leptin stacks up to its related work. For instance, PAC JPEG gets about 22% compression, but its speed is, is closer to 15 megabits per second, rather than our target of 100 megabits per second. JPEG rescan attains our target, but is only able to get about 6% compression by rearranging uh, coefficients in the JPEG, so it gets longer runs of zeros. Lepton uses arithmetic coding and is able to get 22% compression at 150 megabits per second by using various low-level CPU optimizations as well as this multi-threading behavior. Now that we've crafted the algorithm, we were still concerned about the security angle. A maliciously crafted JPEG might be able to trigger buffer overruns, find undefined behavior, and even allow, and find undefined behavior that allowed the compiler to elide bounds checks, for instance, or even exploit use after free errors. One solution could have been to write lepton in a language without undefined behaviors, like Rust. But we opted to run lepton in a seccomp jail SACCOMP limits any syscalls except read, write, or exit, and sig return. But basically, this leaves the would-be attacker only access to standard in and standard out, the only open file descriptors. By starting a separate process per decode and always validating the results with an input SHA-256 sum, we leave the attacker few options to cause harm. However, SACCOMP has some awkward ergonomics. For instance, memory has to be pre-allocated. Standard thread synchronizations are inoperative. We have to craft our own versions of mutexes and, and thread safe queues by opening up pipes and using, and using atomic operations to make sure that the memory was, was serialized between threads when there was communication. And threads needed to be pre-created pre up front. However, this left us with the design that started each thread with a pipe pair 
allocated all memory up front and started a timer before uh, enabling seccomp and finally reading uh, user data. As I mentioned before, Dropbox is a file system, and keeping our user data safe is our top priority. Lepton absolutely has to accurately and correctly represent the files. It needs to be sufficiently deterministic to return the same bitstream each time, and it needs to have strong resistance to our own worst enemy, ourselves. For each image, we compress it with Lepton, encrypt it, and MD5 the result. This is still in memory. It hasn't been persisted to any data store yet. Then for each image, we decrypt it, decompress it in a separate process address space, and make sure the SHA-256 sum matches the one the client computed when it sent us the file in the first place. If anything goes wrong, or the decode times out after a second, we record an error and repeat the process with Zlib. This lets us fall back to something that's guaranteed to work. Finally, after the file has been checked, rechecked, and um, we have the MD5 handy from before the recheck, we simply upload it to our storage systems alongside the MD5. The storage system then verifies that the MD5 really matched, and it continuously scrubs over the MD5 again and again. And if it ever drifts, it recovers the file from replicas. So we have a mechanism to keep things safe if Lepton is deterministic. However, Lepton is multi-threaded C++. It's not actually deterministic. And the thing that keeps us up at night is that Lepton will have successfully round-tripped an image once, computing its shot duties, sum, and everything checking out, and for some reason can never again reconstruct the original data because arithmetic coding uses almost all available data in the process address space to compute the next bit. This is basically the prediction algorithm. If just a small bit of that probability model data was non-deterministic due to a race condition, the error could cascade throughout the whole file and it would become unreadable. To guard against this, we, we have a very strict process by which we qualify every lepton binary to make sure that it acts completely deterministic. First, we build the lepton candidate with both the Intel compiler as well as with GCC with address sanitizer flags on. We run the Intel compiled version and the address sanitized version over four billion images, both in multi-threaded and in single-threaded mode. We make sure that Intel compiled version matches GCC's version in all four cases. Once Lepton's been qualified, it's ready to be pushed since we verified it's deterministic to a large degree of certainty. However, we also fuzz the code using Coverity, and a third party ran a number of other fuzzing tools. Since one of the fuzzers did find something at one point, we decided to add array bounds checks to every array lookup based on user data. This resulted in a 10% performance hit, but we believe the safety to be worthwhile. However, precautionary measures only go so far. We also have to guard against future bugs and operator errors. To this end, we crafted what we know as the safety net. This is a write-only S3 bucket with a 30-day expiration policy. When Lepton was activated or changed significantly, we reactivate the uploads to this bucket. All files in this bucket are simply zlib compressed and encrypted without Lepton. The idea is that this could give us an undo button during deployment if something goes disastrously wrong. When going through the first qualification phase, we, we actually gather statistics on Lepton failures and notice some common trends. For instance, many JPEGs have long zero runs towards the end. These could be sparse files that suffered disk full errors, issues with SD cards, or even power failures during disk sync. But for the most part, these happen at the end. Not always, but Lepton has facilities to serialize out zero runs at the end of the files. Likewise, JPEGs often have arbitrary data at the end. For instance, I have a bunch of JPEGs with TV-ready previews at the end. And I suppose that works out because the JPEG parsers start at the beginning. I suppose these TV parsers would start at the end, and so they kind of agree on something. But uh, we needed to serialize out any data after the JPEG, and we just compress that with Zlib like we do with the header. Finally, some encoders actually throw arbitrary data in the partial bytes at the, at the end of the scan, where the Huffman encoder didn't actually end up filling a byte. In one case, this, a special signature happened for trialware, and I suppose a compliant reader would then remind the user to buy the software. Anyhow, with these safety mechanisms in place and the, and the um, process of running a qualification under our belt, we've, we've been running Lepton in production for about a year now. 
So far, we've encoded more than 200 petabytes of JPEGs, saving more than 46 petabytes. We're re-encoding images from Zlib to Lepton at a rate of 6,000 6, per second, using just spare compute cycles. Here's a power graph of what we call backfill. And the, the backfill is the act of recompressing these old files from Zlib to Lepton. Here we're running on a Xeon E5-2650. And in this graph, we actually disabled Lepton for, power main, for, for various maintenance purposes and then re, and turned it right back on with a couple extra machines, um, which is why it ended up having a little more power. But you can see that we can, we can sustain about 6,000 encodes per second at uh, 300 kilowatts. This means that one kilowatt hour can be traded for about 72,000 encodes, saving 24 gigs of storage. So even on a deep powered hard drive, this can be, the savings cost can be about seven to one. But if you're saving it on durable storage, like S3, it can pay for itself in just under a week, which is kind of cool. Here are some, production, here are some uh, timings from actual decodes in production that we recorded. At eight threads, it gets about 150 megabits per second. With fewer threads, it gets less. But we actually turn off the threads for small files because the thread startup cost actually dominates the cost of decoding. So we actually end up decoding them at a slower rate with fewer threads. I'll end here with a couple of war stories from our usage of Lepton in production. First of all, I mentioned the safety net before. When we initially deployed the Lepton safety net, we ran into one issue that caused an availability hit. The safety net actually naturally requires about twice as much traffic to our durable storage systems. Failing over from one data center to another when a data center is out also requires extra capacity. So our first routine failure, failover test after Lepton shifted traffic from Virginia to Texas. Our proxies, in S3, our proxies to S3 in Texas were totally overwhelmed by the safety net traffic, and our availability dropped quite dramatically until we realized Lepton was the root cause of shutoff compressions. Without compressions, the safety net was unneeded because we would just be decoding images and not creating new ones. New images would just be compressed with Zlib. But as it happens, on December 12, 2016, we had an operator error incident. In this case, there was a field specifying which qualified version of Lepton to deploy to production machines. This was actually a web form field. However, the field defaulted to the oldest qualified version of Lepton from almost a year prior. We didn't have proper directions in our playbook to fill in the field, so a new employee deployed with the field left blank, intending to deploy the newest version, which was quite reasonable. However, the old version went into production. Once it was deployed to a small set of machines, which we call the canaries in the coal mine, availability started to go down on those machines. Also, in the grander scheme of things, Lepton Decode started to reject files with deprecated features on other machines. This exposed a flaw in our qualification procedure. We didn't have a procedure to remove qualification from an older, deprecated versions of Lepton. I'll quickly take an aside into our weekly patterns. They've been scaled to the weekly minimum, but you can see that in, in many cases, during the daytime, there are a lot more decodes and encodes than at nighttime. And this means that there is some amount of free compute time per, per day off of peak. And since the, since the amount of compute time is a small multiple of the amount of free time, this guarantees that we have some free compute because we provision for peak usage. So, Lepton was on for two hours after the incident started. Despite the fact that our playbook told us to turn it off immediately, we, we instead opted to investigate first, which was, which was not ideal, but it meant that we had billions of files to scan through and look for any of these deprecated features. But since we had this free compute, it didn't really take that long. We scanned through those billions of files. We found the 17 that had the deprecated features. We, we decoded them with the old version and re-encoded them with the new version. And to be clear, Lepton has never lost data. And this was just a case of, of basically ha having procedures that didn't go exactly right, but then having enough safety mechanisms to deal with it. So the experience of deploying Lepton has raised a number of interesting concerns. First of all, to us, determinism is super important for a robust system. Likewise, undefined behavior of the language is the enemy of correct systems. Software engineering is hard with defined behaviors, and adding un undefined behavior just adds another wrench to systems. Also, configuration management is hard. Most errors in systems I've seen have boiled down to bad configuration deployments at some level. 
All of this comes down to the issue of safety in the face of human operators and developers. So first, I'd like to, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues for, for making this possible. And I'd also like to thank Matthias Sterner, Gopal Akhani, Archie Russell, and Lauren Merritt for their inspiring JPEG compression work. And uh, I'd like to open up the floor for any questions. So for questions, please state your name and affiliation. Hi, Marco Canini from Kaust. Uh, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. I had uh, one question that goes back to the determinism. So my question is, it seems that uh, determinism is very important, and uh, at the same time, you roll out uh, multiple different versions of the code, so as you improve and in instantiate new features. So I was wondering, how do you deal with uh, the, the necessity for deterministic process at the moment that you have a new version of your binary? Do you need to remember um, a particular deterministic pattern or some random seed that was used for the encoding, or how do you do this process? That's an excellent question. And so to start with, um, our qualification process requires us to decode currently encoded versions with the new to be qualified version. So the idea is to actually root out any, any issue that could be caused by old version. But the, uh, but the question in general is, is a reasonable one. What if we change the lepton model sufficiently that we require essentially a new decoder to understand it, or a new encoder to understand it? And version compatibility is hard. Right now, we've only made minor changes to the lepton format. But I think that if and when we plan a very major upgrade to the format, we may even need a, either a copy of the old decoder or at least enough, enough of the old code that it can basically read the old files. Because this predictor basically uses everything it has available to, to understand the data. But we also encode the version number and the git hash of every, every file that's been encoded. So the very, at the very least, we know how it was encoded. Thank you. Okay, so I have questions for you. Sure. Uh, so compression, the compression that you're doing here, it's providing storage savings, uh, but the cost of this is that you're doing some computation upfront. That's right. And then also, you're doing some computation on download. That's right. right. So uh, have, you, uh, have you done anything like caching normal JPEGs for things that are decompressed many times, or do you keep any normal copies around, or have you thought about that sort of thing? Uh, absolutely. So Dropbox does have uh, what we know as a th thumbnail cache. This doesn't require bit-for-bit -bit accuracy. It's just basically providing previews for users who may be on very small mobile devices. And so we actually end up having some formats that are, that are even different or su suitable for small screens or, or special kinds of screens. And so those end up being what the users interact with in, in a lot of the real-time settings, like when they're scrolling through on their phone or when they are visiting on their website. But also, in, actually, one of, the, one of the could be improvements that we could add very easily is to basically send the pre-warm the cache in certain cases with the originally upload file. Um, it could potentially save a significant amount of compute on our, on our thumbnail generation machines. We don't do that right now. Yeah. OK, cool. So I have one more question for you. But while we do that, let's, oh. Uh, John Howell, Google, I have a question for you. Sure. So it sounds like I can divide the work up into two, two layers. One layer is this aware of JPEGs and understands how to get extract some compression out of them. And then the second layer is what sort of takes the output of the first layer and ensures that it ends up being bit for bit compatible, even if there's a bunch of gunk in the headers and the and the and the tail of the file. So, if I understand that correctly, does that mean you can come along later and sort of plug in new modules for the first layer so that you can compress audio files or or video files? Uh, is that is it kind of something you have planned to to sort of modularly reuse that the framework? So, yeah. So we actually do have we do have a prototype that can compress video files. It uses much of the same technique. It was written with a little bit more of a general, it, w it was written a little bit more generally by, by one of our, our interns at Dropbox named Daniel Kang. He basically, he wrote this video compressor with, with a very high level of abstraction. But when it comes to down to like highly optimized code, you end up throwing away some of that generality. We do have a branch with a very general version of Lepton. Um, it's called Unified Decoder or something on GitHub. So you can see where we've, we've experimented with applying various other predictors to try to guess the probabilities a little better than the, than the ones that are running in production. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so let's thank uh, Daniel once again.